Steve. Um, and, and I think this is kind of important because this goes back to conversations that I've had with, with our mutual friend. And, and In fact, I think I might have brought this up to you, and I'm going to just toss this out. Um, I brought this up with you, and I'm going to toss this out uh, to you. You mentioned earlier, um, and, and Chris, you were talking about this as well, but Steve, you mentioned earlier about the obelisks. The obelisk, um, and, and this is what uh, W is, is, is saying, and, and, and I, I, I kind of understand this. The obelisk, is, the phallic symbol, for example, is the, shall we say, the aliens, or their symbol of salvation, perhaps, as contrasted to the cross. And, and, and they escape judgment via uh, this hybridization process with a species that has been the hope of salvation where they are under an eternal curse. Does that, does that kind of strike at the essence of what you're saying? Well, I think it, I think it, it, it's part of it because obviously in the book of Enoch, there is a, a, you know, a discourse in there where basically the fallen angels are asking Enoch to pray for them. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're in, uh, basically a state of, uh, and this is not all fallen angels. You know, people try and, uh, the 200 that originally, uh, came to earth and did what they did was on Mount Hermon, okay? And the thing is, is that I, I, I know what uh, our mutual friend is saying, but basically you can take it as that was their attempt to achieve in their maybe own twisted minds that if they could just become human, they could be subject, okay, to redemption. Now that's a whole, boy, Chris, now we can get into it. But the point no, being is God, him, God himself called those those entities the bastards, okay? And and so it's fascinating because even on all of the medieval shows, you you always have this connotation running that you have the king's legitimate project, the prod, you know progeny children, but then you got all the illegitimate ones he sired, or in other words, fathered with whoever he slept with, the divine right of kings. So the point being is is that I I, I can tell you this that typically when you're going into a certain period of prehistory, what I would call pre-Adam. And that's a whole ball of a uh, whole other argument. But the point being is, is that usually you'll have a circular uh, stone that lines up almost with the perpendicular, uh, you know, uh, phallic symbol. And uh, basically, it was their way of, I think, commemorating the fact that they were trying to achieve what they had lost by their rebellion. They angels were never meant to procreate, and this is why people take on the silly Sethite series like Hank Hanegraaff and others because they don't understand that the scripture Jesus said in heaven they are neither given nor taken in marriage but are as the angels. But these we're not talking about heavenly angels. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about fallen angels that came to earth. We're talking about the sexual perversion. And by the way, just one of the most interesting uh, uh Oh, science fiction movies that ever came out was in 1965 with Barry McGuire. I'm sorry, uh, Barry Sullivan. I got even destruction on my mind. Barry uh, Sullivan. It was called The Vampire Planet or Planet of the Vampires. In that, I don't know if you saw Chris. They go into an underground cave of an ancient Martian civilization. And what's fascinating, there's these giant skeletons, and they got to be at least 18 to 24 uh, feet tall, that are just the skeletons over a huge table. It's kind of like uh, uh, Land of the Little People in size. So what, what science fiction has done has pretty much, in my opinion, prepared the way. And I, I, I can say this, what our mutual friend is suggesting is actually uh, the plan, that was one of their plans to achieve redemption. It's forbidden to them they can't and that's where the word bastard comes in so when when i use the word bastard uh you know obviously washington fits that in a lot and a great extent of the word and why i say that is i'm not convinced that everything we see and think are humans are humans if an angel fallen angel can change his shape if you will and become a shapeshifter, even take on as an, his appearance as an angel of light. You don't think that he'd have some incentive to become a politician and move to the uh, political pack of piranhas on the Potomac? 
you know, again, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, clear the argument, but I just think that that's one of the two things. But primarily, from all my studies, it was the, it was their, there was, it was their attempt of achieving the procreative ability on earth that they were never meant to possess in heaven. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, it absolutely does. You know, it, it reminds me a lot of, you know, when I first uh, began studying Tom Horn's work and when his original uh, Polyon Rising book came out, you know, how he uh, showed the, the the similarity between Washington, D.C. with an obelisk and a dome, and then the same thing in Vatican City, Rome, you have an obelisk and a dome, it, you have this occultic architecture, you know, and so it, it really seems like, you know, it's pointing to something. And what became very interesting is that when Tom and I started working together and we worked on the book Petrus Romanus, you know, the thesis in that book is that this final pope could fill the role of the biblical false prophet. Now, you know, Tom has always been favorable uh, to the idea that the Antichrist could potentially be an American president. So, you know, if you look at that architecture, you have the dome and the obelisk in Washington, D.C. Uh, that would be the Antichrist. And the dome and the obelisk in Vatican City, that would be the false prophet. Now, I, I don't know if that's right or not, but it, 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 the, the, the correlation is very interesting, and it, it seems to offer some explanatory scope to why that occultic design is in both cities. Well, and, and again, the, the thing that I think is important for people to understand, when, when I wrote the book Genesis 6 Giants, uh, uh, Master Builders of the, you know, the Ancient World, and forgive me because I'm going 100 miles an hour, it, if you notice the scale and the size of ancient architecture, whether you're dealing with the Parthenon, whether you're dealing with Nimrod Dog, and that's in Turkey, whether you're dealing with uh, Angkor Wat, whether you're dealing with the great, the pyramids, any, and, and most people don't understand that many of the nations under agreements with the United States government cover up their true ancient history and they get paid a lot of money. Egypt gets paid a lot of money from the U.S. government to cover up its true history. It's not what you see on the Giza Plateau, but what's under it. And so with the idea being that the truth would be, and I want to make this point clear because a lot of people, Chris, Doug, and Joe, don't get this. The reason why they hide the skeletons of the giants, the reason why they hide the technology of the ancients is because when you trace it all back to the roots, you end up right at Genesis 6. And they cannot, in, in, in the plan of the age-old deception that Lucifer has put into play and now carrying it out, if the point B is, is that everything that they could use as subterfuge was used as subterfuge until they could hide no longer. And this is why when you, Chris and Tom, did it, you know, Exo Vaticana and did your amazing uh, finds on Mount Graham, even to the name of the Lucifer, you know, what, infrared telescope, the point being is, is that it's, it's like all of the seams of the tapestry. I'm thinking of the famous Bayou Tapestry. And, and uh, you know, the Battle of 1066, the, the, the amazing battle scenes. But what, what we've done and what God has given us up to a certain point, all of us have a piece of the puzzle. When you guys came along with Exo Vaticana, I believe that was a timed piece of the puzzle that could not be put into place until the Lord God of Heaven chose it to go. Now, obviously, it's almost like as it is ready to be fulfilled, God's not allowing any time lag between the event and the fulfillment, so there's nobody to say, well, gee, I didn't figure that one out, you know. When you've spelled it out, when you've basically documented it out, when you've portrayed it, when you've seen that, you know, a simple statement by Jesus goes a long way. How about this one? The tree is known by the fruit it bears. And if we're facing the biggest ecumenical movement in the history of the world, if we're on the verge of World War III right now in the Ukraine and with all the tensions in Russia and China, the U.S., Japan, all this stuff, this is all orchestrated. All the devil has to do is just kick it into high gear, then back it down a few notches, come on the scene, the man of peace, and voila. There's no doubting any longer, has the tribulation officially started, or do you see it necessary for the tribulation temple to be built? Now, I'm being sarcastic on, on purpose. 
people are looking for events into the future and they don't see what's happening right now. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yeah, I think a lot of people are kind of asleep at the wheel when it when it comes to that. You know, when I've been kind of tracking everything since we wrote Exo Vaticana, I mean, there's been some recent developments that are just really interesting. Uh, the Vatican just had another astrobiology conference. Uh, you know, in the book, we spoke of the one that happened in 2009 in Rome, where actually the Pontifical Academy of Sciences invited the top astrobiologists and atheist astronomers and, you know, just the top people in the field to Rome in the year 2009 for a, for a study week. And at that conference, uh, Chris Empey, who is kind of a Buddhist sort of thinker um, at the University of Arizona, he gave the keynote speech and he announced in Rome that he thought that they would have a major announcement within a few short years. And that's pretty much a direct quote. Now, he was talking probably about all the evidence they're finding for what they call exoplanets. I mean, these, these guys are convinced that they're going to discover a, a planet that, that has life. And that's really, you know, this is the sort of thing they're promoting in the media. Now, you know, that few short years that he said in 2009 is obviously over, and they just had another conference. This time they did it in Arizona. And uh, it was the same sort of thing. And actually, the theme of this one was was searching for these planets. And they just came out with an announcement last week about the planet they think is the most Earth-like they've ever found. Um, so it's it's progressing, but I think the evidence that these planets are actually inhabitable is really weak. Um, the sort of claims they're making are a lot stronger than the science that they're doing. But the thing that I find fascinating is at the same time that they're doing all this, one of the lead Jesuit astronomers who we actually interviewed in the book, uh, Guy Consul Magna, he's with the one that, you know, was giving a lot of interviews probably four or five years ago about baptizing extraterrestrials into the Catholic Church. Well, you know, right on cue, he's out in the media talking about that again. In fact, he's actually getting a lecture at a, at a university in the United Kingdom about baptizing extraterrestrial. That's actually the title, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? So here we have, you know, a high-ranking Jesuit astronomer, one of the spokespeople for the Vatican Observatory Research Group, you know, giving an academic lecture at a major European university, and the topic is, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Uh, I think that uh, it's obvious to me that the culture is being conditioned to accept this notion of benevolent spiritual extraterrestrials. Well, and and again, the fact that these are not these are not flaky guys with Celestron, uh, you know, small telescopes. These are the people that represent the the most uh, advanced. Uh, astronomical, astrophysical instruments. These are the people who are considered by their own peers the smartest people in the world, and they're getting it ready. And, you know, let's say they find Earth 2, sister planet uh, uh, Sierra Sunrise. I'm just making that up. The point being is, is that then, obviously, the minute they define the exoplanet as being most Earth-like, then, well, who lives there? And, you know, I, I think that the trouble with all of this comes in to the confrontation, though, that's already brewing. The reason why Christians are coming under persecution, let's get to that, is because in a nation, forgive me, in a world that is embracing the ultimate lie, they have no room for truth. In a nation now that has been, and I would say this, subjugated electromagnetically through mind control, for, through the air we breathe, the water we drink, the genetically altered food we're eating, everything that's going in is designed for one reason and one reason only. It's to take away that last bit of humanness. And here's a question I get answered all the time, and here's how I answer it, Chris, and I want your input. What percentage could a person have Nephilim blood, fallen angel blood, and their bloodlines and still be saved? Do you ever get that question? I, I, I've heard it debated back and forth a bit. Um, you know, I don't know how to quantify those percentages. But, right. Uh, I suspect... Well, I, think, I think... Go ahead. <laughs> I suspect that, um, you know, it, 
that humanity is not so defined, you know, with, with by Nephilim blood or not Nephilim blood. I, I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time uh, saying that someone can't be saved because that just seems like that's something that only the Lord knows. And, and I would never, uh, you know, venture to, to make that kind of declaration uh, and tell somebody that they were beyond being saved. I just don't think that that's my place to do that. Uh, I'm going to try to preach the gospel to all men. And, you know, whether they respond answer. or not, yeah. Have a great answer for it, though, okay? Think about okay. this. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. When all who call upon the name of the Lord, that word all is inclusive. My answer is simple. Mm-hmm. It's, not a, it's not a theological thing that you got to, you know, try and argue how many angels fit on the head of a pin, you know? Number one, they're brighter than that. Why would they want to spend time on a pin? But the point being is is that if we accept Jesus Christ, we become new creations. And in Doug's uh, introduction on the box of chocolates, which our mutual friend contributed to and pretty much gave Doug the insight of what's really happening, bottom line is that sin is a quantifiable and identifiable trait in the human genome. And this is so cool, this is so cool, that when we come to Jesus, there is a definable and quantifiable change even in our DNA. Now, I'm talking about a true, true biblical conversion. So the answer is, the people are asking, the, 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 the people that ask me that question are asking me the wrong question. My answer is simply this, if you can call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved, because that's God's promise to all. It does not cover fallen angels on the earth, though, because that issue was dealt with by the book of Enoch. God literally uh, it kind of uh, uh, straightens Enoch out and says, Enoch, they should be praying for you. But again, the point being is anybody. So I'm hoping, because I actually dug Joe and, and, and Chris, I get people asking that question. simple. Anybody who can call upon the name of the Lord in a heartfelt repentance can be saved. Whatever their DNA and genetic makeup is, is, go, is covered by the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that a great answer? I believe God gave me that answer because I was going, man, I don't know how to quantify that. That's your department, Lord. I can't say who is and who isn't saved. That's your department. And he said, well, just go to my word, Stephen. My word is my word. And made it easy. So if you ever encounter that one, Chris, there's a great answer, and it's biblical. And it's from the word of God.